Welcome to Around the Weird. Here's your host, the museum curator of the strange and unusual, Mr. Nothing. Thank you, mysterious voice. And welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about all the unusual and out of the ordinary literature that we have found, uh, or that I have found in my travels. Today, it is supposed to be Poetry Thursday, but I wanted to really, really, really talk about one of the books that I have just finished. Uh, something that is very interesting, and it is about hockey and racism and boarding schools. And you know, hockey and racism aren't always mutually exclusive. Sometimes they're very, very tightly connected. I am referring to Indian Horse by Richard Wagamese. For those who don't know, Richard Wagamese was a member of the Ojibwe tribe, a tribe that was found, or that has been found traditionally in uh, Canada, in the in the sort of central and eastern, kind of around the Great Lakes region. Although um, after uh, contact with Europeans, they were displaced, of course, and put on reservations and thrown into boarding schools. Uh, so the Ojibwe tribe has, you know, you know, traditionally been in those areas, but you might find them elsewhere after after contact with the Europeans. And so Richard Wagamese was a writer uh, who was known for writing both fiction and nonfiction centered on the uh, indigenous experience. And he also wrote about his experiences, his personal experiences as a member of the Ojibwe tribe. Uh, and so with that, you end up with stories like Indian horse or stories about medicine people, uh, and uh, he's, he's won awards for that. Uh, unfortunately, he died in 2017, but he, uh, after he died, he was able to, or his family was able to get Indian Horse, the story I'm talking about today, uh, turned into a movie that premiered on Netflix. So if you want to go check it out before you read the book, uh, which would be very unusual, but you can do that. Uh, you can go check out Netflix. I am not sponsored by Netflix, so, you know, there's no tie-in there. Uh, apparently, the movie was um, in some way, like, produced by Clint Eastwood, if that's something that excites you. Uh, I know that um, present-day Clint Eastwood ha doesn't have the, the same power that, uh, you know, 80s and 90s Eastwood had, but he's still an interesting character. Uh, so anyways, without further ado, let's talk about the story at hand. I will try to be brief in my summary, although I don't think I will be. Uh, I'll do an analysis and we'll move on there, move on from there. But also I should highlight, I'm not going to spoil the story in the summary section. So I'll, I'll provide you with a somewhat brief uh, section that, do that doesn't tell you anything about the ending. But I may spoil, or I'm definitely going to spoil the story in the uh, analysis section just because you know, uh, there's a lot of points that I that I want to get to that are connected to the end of the story. So just be aware of that. So Indian Horse focuses on the character of Saul Indian Horse, a member of the Ojibwe tribe in Canada. Uh, he is uh, at the start of the story. He is in a treatment facility, uh, recalling his pa uh, his past life, uh, and uh, his doctor has instructed him to write. And so that's kind of what we're seeing with this story, with him writing out what has happened. Uh, he, uh, we, we learned that Saul has sort of succumbed to alcoholism, but we don't quite know why at that moment. And he also indicates that at one point he could see visions, although he believes that, uh, those visions have since left him. We are then taken back to a very young Saul growing up in the Canadian bush. Uh, it appears that Saul is being hidden along with his family in the, um, in the Canadian wilderness because they don't want the Zanagush. Uh, the Canadian settlers of the time. Not really the Canadian settlers. This story takes place in the 1960s when the, uh, as the, um, as the uh, boarding school system was coming to an end. Uh, but it still takes place during that time. So the, the Canadian uh, government agents will come and take take children away and so that's unfortunately already happened to Saul's sister and then it happens to um, Benjamin uh, um, uh, Saul's brother and uh, very fortunately though Benjamin manages to flee back to the family and escape from the boarding school unfortunately he comes back home with tuberculosis and so the family decides that they have to flee to God's Lake to prevent them from taking not only Benjamin but also Saul in the future and so 
They go to God's Lake, which is their ancestral home, uh, not only of the Ojibwe people, but also of their specific family. And Saul begins to have visions where, where he sees uh, the original Indian horse, his grandfather, um, who sort of like tries to speak to him, although Saul can't quite hear at that point in time what's happening. Uh, and so, unfortunately, while they're there, Benjamin dies of tuberculosis. And so the, uh, Benjamin's mom, Saul's mom, uh, wants to take Benjamin back to the city to get him blessed by a priest because she, um, uh, she was sort of indoctrinated into the Christian religion when she was in the boarding school. And so they go, but when uh, when Saul and his grandmother are left alone, they, they quickly find that it doesn't seem like the family is coming back. And Saul never actually learns what happens to his mother and father. But the grandmother decides that they have to go to a friend's uh, location upriver if they're going to survive the winter. And so they travel there. Uh, unfortunately, due to a boat mishap, uh, Saul and his, and his grandmother manage to get stranded and uh, the grandmother dies. But Saul is, is rescued by a group of strangers who take him to a nearby boarding school. That boarding school is St. Jeremy's, a place that Saul describes as incredibly hellish. The, the nuns uh, whip and beat and torture the students. Uh, they, uh, the priest and, and also the nuns as well rape some of the students. Anybody who, uh, who rejects or uh, tr uh, doesn't allow themselves to sort of become indoctrinated into this messaging is eventually killed. Uh, and even the, 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 the students who don't like resist, they, they might find themselves dying of disease or uh, some sort of accident because there's not a lot of regulation happening at these places. And so the, the, uh, the priest and the nuns don't really care if these Indian children live or die. They're just trying to teach them the ways of God because they believe that all these, these indigenous uh, Canadian kids are, uh, are heathens for, for their Indian ways. And so this is the life that, um, that Saul has been brought into. Uh, where uh, he, he witnesses all this and he kind of shrinks back into himself, uh, where he, he tries to you know hide and make sure no one can can harm him. Uh, and it's at this time that he's introduced to Father Le Boutillier, um, a man uh, a man of God and uh, one who everyone kind of is drawn to. Um, and it's indicated at first that it seems like Le Boutillier is is on their side, the indigenous children's side. He introduces the children to hockey, which Saul takes to right away. Uh, he becomes very proficient in the sport. Uh, and Father Le, Le Boutillier, like uh, shows him like the the TV channel hockey, and Saul learns quickly through all that, and so it eventually reaches a point where uh, uh, some some people from the nearby town uh, try to recruit Saul because of his skill. Uh, which Le Boutillier allows. Um, but after a few games, the, um, the townies decide uh, to exclude Saul because he is an Indian. And as Le Boutillier later points out, the, these townies believe that hockey is their game. It's more specifically, the white man believes that hockey is their game and they can't tolerate an, an, an Indian kid like Saul uh, playing the game. Eventually, Saul is adopted by the Kelly family, including Fred Kelly. Uh, they're a hockey family, and Fred's son Virgil ha is part of a hockey team called the Moose, which they invite Saul to join because he's so good. And they ma mainly play tournament games against other reservations. Uh, and uh, Saul is very happy with this. He's living a, a very happy life, and he's uh, the, his vision of the game is what keeps him going because he, he believes that he's so good, and also like it connects him to his roots. It seems, at, at least in, in the beginning of the story. Uh, eventually, they're they're uh, approached by Kapuska Singh. If I'm pronouncing that right, they're a team called the Kapuska the Chiefs, essentially. Uh, and they're uh, a white team uh, from, from sort of a, a bigger league, and they they they've heard about Saul and the team, and so they request to play them. And Saul and them eventually beat the Kapuska Singh, and this gets them invited to more games in the big leagues. But these people are more aggressive, and the crowds are far more vehemently racist against the Moose. Eventually, reaching a point where even their own team uh, team fans like start saying racist things to them. Uh, which only makes uh, uh, Saul angrier and play in more aggressively, and he starts to lose his love of the game at this point. Eventually, he's approached by the Toronto Maple Leafs, and they ask him to join their farm, his, the farm team, 
uh, which Saul takes some controlling to do because he, re he realizes like the racism might be too much. But um, he eventually, because of his, his uh, Virgil and his other team members, he, he decides to um, become a part of the team. But again, he's met with more racism, uh, not only from the opposing team who 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 seem to target him and try to get in the fight, although he resists it uh, at first, uh, but also from his own fans who shout racial slurs and and um, do those stereotypical like Indian uh, motions in the game, but also from the media as well, who when they're writing about Saul use stereotypical Indian terms like counting coup or or collecting scalps, and it's never that he's just a hockey player. They only see the Indian within him. And it eventually gets to be too much for Saul and he quits the team. This leads to him going back uh, back home to the Kellys where he, uh, he um, takes up a lumberjacking lifestyle. But even that's too much for him because in the bush he still meets that racism from his co-workers. And he just decides, I'm done, I'm going to leave this town. The Kellys try to persuade him else, elsewise um, and Virgil even notes that he's just being a quitter by leaving. But he decides that it's time to to, to go to drifting and, and leave. And he again he 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 comes up with a fake identity each time he arrives some, somewhere else. It's as if he's trying to escape who he is. And eventually he drifts into alcoholism. And the story progresses from there. But I won't tell you what happens at this point, as I want you to read the story for yourself. In terms of analysis, there is quite a bit to talk about with this amazing story. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about, and I will talk about spoilers here, uh, is the one thing that pops up immediately at this story. You're met with the horrors of the boarding school. I've heard a lot about boarding schools um, based on my experiences of studying uh, indigenous history and, and working with indigenous individuals. Uh, so I've come to know that like a lot of indigenous individuals refer to it as the boarding school holocaust uh, because it's every bit as, as bad as, as um, the, the Jewish holocaust and it, it's it's somewhat less reported but like there's so much stuff that happened and it it, it left so many people changed for the worse um you you hear a lot of that in this story although it's a fictional account it, it still takes from what happened in reality you have kidnapping torture beatings murder um uh, children put in torture devices uh, if they act out. Children who wet themselves and are beaten for doing so. Like the the priests set set up these children to fail. The nuns set up these children to have accidents and then mess up. And then they're beaten even more so for doing so. And if you try to stand up for yourself at all, you're beaten even more to the point where you might die or you just you just lose your own resolve. And so uh, there's just so much that, that's wrong at this boarding school. The, one of the worst First things is, that happens is is rape, which happens uh, at least when when it's first introduced in the story. We learn that it, it's happening to the other children, uh, but later on in the story we learn that Father Le Boutillier actually raped um, Saul, um, and he he sort of glossed over that part. But so it seems like nobody's uh, able to escape the terror of this school. It just it just keeps going on and on and on, and your only hope is to escape and find something else. Or wait for this, the boarding school system to uh, lose fashion, which is which would never actually happen uh, for quite some time, at least in regards to the time period for this story. So the question is, why are the priest and the nuns so angry at these Indian children? Like, what about them is making them? do such extreme actions? Why would the government co-sign this? And it really seems like the problem at hand is that these children are Indian and in the eyes of the Canadian government, as well as the Australians for their for their indigenous people, and including in America, the problem was being an Indian was a crime. Uh, they did not like the color of your skin. They did not like that you had a rightful claim to this land. So they set about uh, dismantling every aspect of the uh, of the Indian in the hopes that you you could kill them or just dis or get them to so far down into like the dregs of society that they wouldn't rise up again. And there's a good quote that I would like to read you from this. She smiled again with the same ghastly lack of feeling. At Saint Jerome's, we work to remove the Indian from our children so that the blessings of the Lord may be evidenced upon them. And the question is, I, another question is like, like if the Lord loves everybody, why does he view Indian children as so wrong? And it really gets you thinking like, 
the, there's nothing wrong with being an Indian. It's these people who claim to be uh, messengers or, or servants of the Lord, but are actually beating and, and killing children. And it, it's, it really opens your eyes to the horrors of the, of the boarding school uh, and, and what life was like for indigenous individuals in Canada and, and many other places at the time. Uh, w- one thing that you could point out is like, oh, well, Father Le Boutillier is uh, was a um, was a good person in this system, so it couldn't have been all bad. But that does raise a lot of questions. Like, if Father Le Boutillier really had a problem, and at one point he says that these people lack charity, like if if that was really a problem for. Uh, Father Le Boutillier, he wouldn't work here or he would actively fight to dismantle the system. And that's a good point that um, I, I don't think uh, Wagamis was trying to make, but it's still uh, very important. If you work, if you are in a system that is corrupt or hurts people and you fail to actively fight that system and you just try to fix it from the inside, you're no better than the people in that system. You are co-signing that system that hurts so many other people. And that's a very important point um, to make with, with all of these. And it's, a, it, but that, even that's like not really um, a big problem because we later find out that Le Boutillier was raping students as well, especially Saul. And so that's, that's like, okay, like Le Boutillier isn't good for one reason, but he's definitely not good for another. I do think that that's uh, kind of problematic in the story and that you could have just, you could have just left Le Boutillier as like, um, uh, as a person in this system who maybe exploits children to, for his hockey team. And it would have been, it would have been just as bad, I think, uh, because, especially with what one of the, one of the characters says later about how not all, not all rape needs to be physical. Some of it can be spiritual. And so, um, that's, that's one of the minor problems that I have with this story. Another idea, another big thing that pops up in this story is that of, of the connection between hockey and racism. This, this applies to most sports. You could say football and racism or baseball and racism. No, every sport has seen its fair share of prejudice and, and bias towards people of color. In this case, um, it's, it's, it's towards the indigenous people of Canada who are trying to get a leg up or even pursue an activity that they enjoy but are met with racism. Saul uses this sport as an escape. Uh, first from being assaulted by uh, Father Le Boutillier. We later learned that he turned to hockey as a way of, of zoning out and, and forgetting the fact of uh, forgetting what Father Le Boutillier did to him. But he, he, he notes that he couldn't do it for very long because he was, he was being shouted at and, and he experienced all these racial slurs and all these attacks by players who were uh, doing cheap shots during the game and not being called out by the referees. Uh, and, and that's that's pretty difficult for this to be your escape. And even if this wasn't Saul's escape, he should have still been able to play the game without experiencing this type, type of thing. Uh, but as as Virgil and as Father Le Batillier and as Saul even note multiple times throughout the story, they are mad at the Indians because they're good, when because they believe that hockey belongs to them. You've seen that in many sports where you, there's the introduction of people of color and then you get a whole bunch of people mad because those those people of color are actually good and um, redu- uh, like re- removing that color barrier makes the people mad because this was their sport. They were good at this and now uh, it, it appears that uh, they, they have competition which they do not enjoy. There's another good quote that I would like to read to you. Then we ran into the black heart of Northern Ontario in 1960s. We hated, and we were hated. Hated. There was no other word for it. The moose came out of the bush as a team that wanted to prove itself against the best competition around. We arrived in those towns as hockey players expecting to play a square game, stick to stick, end to end, fair and equal. But they only ever saw us as Indians. They only ever saw brown faces where white ones should have been. We were an unwelcome entity in the mist. And when we won, it only made things worse. And so right there, you, you get the crux of, of, the, of hockey in the story, where these indigenous kids didn't have a lot going on for them because they were forced into boarding schools and treated like garbage. And hockey should have been a, an escape, a, a way for them to express their talent or skill in, in a number of other areas. But it's quickly found that, no, white people can't accept that. Anytime... A, a, an indigenous or a person of color really tries to escape the prejudice and bias they find in society through sport or something they love. Like it angers white individuals to see someone so, as they say in a story, so uppity, someone who doesn't know their place. And that's, that's really the, uh, 
the the crux of, of the problem in the story and another problem is that there's no allies for Saul especially when he gets to the big leagues like the fans just shout racist things at him that's not helping the other team even his own team members kind of distance themselves because he's not willing to engage in fight uh, most likely because uh, if you engage in that fight like you're only admitting that they they were right about you that you are indeed a savage or something like that and the press doesn't help either because they're willing to engage in those stereotypes about Saul like they they should at least report report accurately and fair but they're not doing that in this story uh, often because they they were you know working with the government or they had a they had an extreme bias and so that's I, I really like how Wagami like gets at that like how um even like you can't escape the the oppression and racism that exists in regular society and in your hobbies you should be able to but it's not even there like the racism for indigenous americans at the time and even today um like it extends so far into hockey that that uh, there really is no escape for it and another thing I want to talk about that, that I covered a little bit with the horrors of the boarding school was the trauma of racism and hate. The trauma that it brings out and how it leaves you broken, sad, and, and defeated because there's nothing you can do. It lingers with you forever to be told so often that you are less than. It, like I don't have personal experience being a white individual, but based on the stories and and what I've heard other people say, like to be told you're less than or you're not equal and you don't deserve the same rights or liberties as as the the people in, in charge, like that ha not only affects you like immediately, but down the road, it's gonna produce lingering mental health issues, like lingering side effects, because like, why wasn't I good enough? Like, why, why did the society do this to me? Uh, you see that a lot in Invisible Man too, um, where in Invisible Man, the, the main character eventually lashed out. And Saul does that to some extent too, as he starts fighting back. And that's the reason why he hates hockey so much is because it, it takes the fun out of, the, out of the entire sport. And so you end up with Saul who is forever changed by this rape and this hate and, and the, the distress that he experiences while playing hockey. He turns to alcoholism, he pushes people away uh, devolving into depression and loneliness because if if anybody's around he, he has to tell people like who he is and uh, the rape that he experienced when he was younger like he doesn't want anyone to know about that he doesn't even want to address it himself because uh, he'll come to realize that that love of hockey was formed around uh, a desire to keep quiet or um, sort of a, a cajoling to keep quiet by Le Boutillier and uh, maybe part of his life is probably a lie um and it, so you don't want to like confront any of that and that's what being around other people will do and for many others and uh, as mentioned by the story and in real life there was the, the the aspect of suicide where going through so much trauma your whole life like you commit suicide as a, as a young child or even later in your life that it just becomes so unbearable to deal with all that and it's really really sad uh, the, uh, the most important aspect of this is the, the how Wagamese actually addresses the overall cost in this story. Uh, the, when, when Saul goes back to the Kellys at the end of the story, in a beautiful moment, they have a conversation about what, what Le Boutillier did, uh, what it cost all of the people, all of the natives who went, who went to the boarding school. And there's a good quote that I would like to read to you. I felt tears building and I pinched my lips together and gazed out the window. Cost me a lot, I said. It cost everything, Fred said. It bankrupts us in every way. The lucky ones rebuild. There's a lot of those kids who never got the chance. And that really strikes me. Like it makes me choke up and feel like intensely sad that that happened to natives at the time and still continues to this day because there are a lot of people who are still alive who went through the boarding school and who, who still like experience that sorrow and grief that they were forever changed. And it costs them so much to run away or or to hide from from the fact that all that happened to them. Uh, it's it's really it's really tragic. And I know it's it's not they uh, that natives don't want you to pity them, but it's it's okay to feel angry alongside of them that this happened and that this was allowed to to go on by the government and the people who should have put a stop to it and just never did. It it, it makes me go back to. Um, to Le Boutillier's quote in the story where he says, uh, like where Saul asks about one of the torture devices that the school has. And he says, why do they have this? And Le Boutillier says, 
uh, because they lack charity. And that make going back to that part when after learning what Love Atelier did, and it's like, you want to talk about how they lack charity? Look at what you did. Look what you did to Saul. Like, look at your hypocrisy and how it affected people. And it's just like, I like that Wagamese can make me feel so angry about a character and, and so connected to these people. Like, it's, it's great writing. And another thing that Wagamese does is, like, he, he offers a, a cure. Like, maybe you can't totally fix the trauma that these boarding schools and this racism unfolded upon the, the natives. But what you can do is, is um, sort of re-embrace your origins and know that your, your Ojibwe or your, your other tribe, your, uh, that, that's who you are. You're not the person who the boarding school created. You are the person uh, with the ancestry of the Ojibwe or whatever tribe um, is applicable to you. And to, you have to embrace that. You can't let the, the, the hate that they gave you and the racism that they threw at you define you. And I think that's a very powerful message on Wagamese's part. It just, it just, it, it, it really uh, like hit me really hard, and it made this book stand out in a way that a few others have had uh, so far since I started this channel, and even before then, since I've been reading my, my 29 years. Another thing I want to talk about is like, what does this mean today? Uh, how should we take this story like going forward? Now that we know about the boarding school and the racism that indigenous Canadians and Americans and, and Australians and a wide variety of indigenous peoples experience, what do we do with that knowledge? And I think a lot of what we have to do is we have to say that it happened. We have to acknowledge that this is what the government did. This is what the church did. This is what so many people allowed to happen. And there's a lot of people who want to bury that and say, oh, that happened in the past, but we have to move on. And to that, I say there are still people alive who experience that. And we can't just forget that that happened. Because if you try to bury the past and ignore what the, the terrible things your government did, it dooms us to repeat that down the road. People like Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham and Donald Trump want to say that we should move on and that, it, and that we can't offer reparations to people of color, or in this case, Native Americans, because uh, too much time has passed. But that's the only fair thing to do in this situation. You inflict a whole bunch of trauma on a group of people and you don't do anything to fix it. That's, that, that shows that you don't care about those people. You can't simply offer an apology and then, and then move on. You have to show that you actually care about uh, what, what happened. And you have to, you have to show that you're taking steps to make sure it never happens again. And I feel like many governments aren't actually doing that part. Another minor issue that I have with this story, though, is we don't know too much about Saul because through the story, he doesn't reveal a lot about himself other than what he's experiencing. To, to us, we learn that Saul is just the sum of his experiences. But I do have to say that maybe that's the point that, that Richard Wagamese was probably getting at, especially because if, we, if Saul were to reveal more of himself in the, earlier in the story, we would learn exactly what happened to him. And in order for the story to flow, that has to be a realization that we learn at the end. And then he can discover himself and reconnect with his roots. So uh, I, I do think that's a minor problem, but um, it's addressed in the text through some way. Anyway, those are my thoughts on uh, Indian Horse by Richard Wagamese. Uh, this is a 30 minute video from what I can see so far. And of course, yeah, I absolutely love the video. So of course it's gonna be 30 minutes or so. Uh, I definitely recommend it to you out there. It is a pretty hard story to read, but we need to read these hard stories and make ourselves uncomfortable if we're ever gonna produce a positive change in the world to address the trauma that we inflicted upon uh, Native Americans. To to even if we didn't do it ourselves, we still have to address it and, and make a plan going forward to make sure this never happens again. Uh, so yeah, I definitely recommend it. And I, I got to say it's one of the, the best stories that, I, that I've read this year. I know I keep saying that uh, as of late. Also, I read this for my book club that I'm doing. So I got to say, you know, that that Bevan, Bevan, her name is Bevan, and she wants to start a booktube channel too. So I, to Bevan, you know, absolutely do that. But also the the book the book club made a good choice this month on, some, on, on picking um, a book that's powerful and, and worth discussing. And so, yeah, th those are my thoughts. Uh, if you have something to say about the book uh, or, you know, my, um, if you read this before and you want to comment on it, do so below. Let's have a discussion about Indian Horse and Richard Wagamese.
Otherwise, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so that more people can find out about this author and this, this powerful book. And until then, I wish you the best of luck in your weird and uh, reparation-y travels. Farewell.